There he is. <laughs> What's up, guys? Oh, you know that song? I can't remember who said, let's give them something to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's just like, it's nonstop with you, Kevin. It's nonstop. I, we're just talking about, uh, well, a lot, first of all. We're, we have a lot to discuss with you. Thank you for joining us. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, I want to just make sure this is clear and we can get verification from the general manager himself. This was scheduled last week, this 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 call. So it's not like Kevin's coming on today to make some big enough. We're just, this was scheduled, but we have some stuff to talk about. What was your reaction yesterday to Bob McKenzie? One of the, he's probably the biggest in the hockey world out there on social media. What was your reaction when you read that, Kevin? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, I'm not on social media, so I'm lucky to have people around me that uh, none of us are. Um, but uh, no, you know what? I think here, here's the thing. Um, people call and make phone calls and ask about players every day. And my job is to listen and have conversations. I think it's something that I, I want to make very clear that we have no um, intention and we're not shopping Jack or talking to teams uh, looking to do anything with Jack. It's just people call and ask questions and, and you have conversations. So that's really the extent of it. Kev, yeah, I, I you know, I, I want to start with Eric Stahl. You know, how did this trade go down? Did you did you have to have a conversation with him to kind of, you know, make him feel that this is the right spot for him moving forward? And you know, you know, how did that all go down with Eric? Yeah. Did you well, hear it from the instigators? Is the real question? Because <laughs> I'm sorry to chime in here, Kevin, but we talked about it that morning. You. You talked about what you talked about trading for Eric Stahl. That no, we traded for Eric Stahl on Wednesday morning. And 11.35. Yeah, 11, 11, Check the tape, Kevin. Kevin. Check the tape. You guys have my phone bugged or something? You're 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 on me, but uh, <laughs> no, I think I, I think I mean talking to you three guys, um, you know what it's like to be traded and to go through um, that part of the business. So. Um, I guess to answer that your question, Rivs, like when I talked to Eric right after the trade, you know, it, it was simply this is uh, I, I don't want to talk about hockey right now. I know you got a million things going in your brain. You have a family. You, you're thinking about your kids school and hockey and what are you going to do with a house? I mean, that's all the natural reaction. I mean, we've all been traded. We understand. So I wanted to make sure that was very clear. Um, he appreciated that. We had a great chat the next day where. Um, he, he appreciated that it wasn't like me saying, Hey, this is what you're going to do in the lineup and, you know, talking about hockey. So we were fortunate enough the next day to catch up and spend a bit of time and talk about, okay, where's he at and how's he, how's he feeling? And, um, and you know, guys, I think I'm, I'm fortunate where a trade like this, um, did a lot of homework on Eric as a player and where his game currently at is how, how we thought he could help us on the ice because the other part I already knew. You know, I, I, I know him as a person. I um, know everything he stands for, his character, what he will be in the locker room, the professionalism. I mean, all those things were stuff that you would do your homework on typically, but I already knew that having having been a former teammate. So um, he was great. He said, look, I'm excited. Let me know what we need to do um, to, to help this team win. You know, it was a great conversation. Do you send, and, and not just because it's Eric Stahl, but in, in a lot of trades where a, a big name is acquired, Do you send a bunch of the players Eric Stahl's contact number so they can text him, reach out to him so that they can, you know, get a sense for what kind of person he is right away? Or is that developed a little later? Yeah, no, that that did happen, although I didn't I didn't have to do it. Guys, guys reached out to him, found, you know, everybody within the league kind of knows each other. So it's uh, pretty easy um, to do that. But I, I was proud of when I heard the next day that um, a number of our players had reached out to Eric and had just welcomed him and said they were looking forward to him. And, you know, the one thing that I, I took um, really serious from my conversation as a follow-up with Kyle, to Kyle Akposa was, you know, he mentioned there's only a handful of guys in the league when they walk into the locker room, get everyone's attention. Um, because of who they are as a player, what they've done in their career, and then who they are as a person. And Eric's on that you know, small list. So I think, uh, to me, it's a big message to our team that we want to get better, um, to our fans, that we're doing everything we can to, to help move the needle here in a positive direction. Kev, uh, we want to talk about uh, the draft coming up, but I mean, you know, the Eric Stahl news was huge, huge news. And I, I you know, you just mentioned something, and I, before we move on, 
I kind of compare his demeanor to like Sidney Crosby. Maybe not, maybe not the dominance in numbers, but he's had dom- he's had Crosby like years. But I mean, the way he presents himself, the way he does an interview, conducts himself, prepares himself from what I hear, all those things. Like he just, he, th- am I wrong with that in saying that he's he's in that upper echelon of like guys that are respected around the league? Yeah, no, I think that's fair. PD and I and I, I say this when he, when he was 18 years old and he was a number two overall draft pick coming into our locker room he sat between Rod Brendamore and Ron Francis. I can't think of two better guys that I'd want an 18 year old franchise player to learn from, and so I you know having had that information you know he was he was influenced and he certainly came in the league mature and he was a pro already but then you add those two guys and then what he's done in his career. Um, and how he's handled himself um, at the biggest stage. And what I like about Eric is, besides just the person, is he's got a um, little swagger to him, but in a humble way, if that makes any sense. Um, he knows he's he is extremely good, um, and he isn't afraid to have that moxie, but not in an arrogant like way that it would rub people the wrong way. You know what I'm saying? So I'm trying to get at that he's going to bring some swagger to our team, um, but in a sounds home. like he's going to be sitting beside Dylan Cousins. If, uh, yeah, <laughs> sorry, you know. sorry, sorry. I, I don't mean I don't mean to pry there, Kevin, but I mean that, that just sounds too sounds too similar. Well, and you know what? I don't want to under underestimate what the influence though on Jack Eichel as well, and among others. You know, like Jack's still a young guy and the young guy in in the league, and with uh, high expectations, and you know, um, you know, a lot of feeling like, okay, I have them, the captain, and, you know, Eric's gone through all those things, so I think he'll, in a way, uh, be able to help Jack also. Draft coming up, draft prep. I don't know if these guys are going to chime in here anymore, but, I, you know, you got the, the number eight pick. We talked about it a lot. You know, I, I don't want to flat out ask you what you're going to do with it, but, I mean, what are you going to do with it? You know, I'm, but there's some great talent. There's some highly talented players here, Kevin, coming into the draft. I mean, as a new GM – wouldn't you, wouldn't you, I mean, obviously, I don't know what your thoughts are on trading if the right deal comes along, but as a new GM, wouldn't you be excited to make a pick that high with a talented player like that? Yeah, I think, uh, um, well, I mean, how many, how many guys have you had on here that asked what you were going to do with it and then they just told you, PD, or should I just tell you what we, what we want to do? Or everyone, should... actually, everyone is pretty open with us. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think, I think from my perspective, um, a couple of things. One, I want to make sure I, let everybody know how proud I am of the work that's gone on from the, the scouts and from Jeremiah Crow and Jason Nightingale to since June when the transition happened, the amount of work that's gone in and the strategy. Um, one of the first discussions we had the, the day everything happened when my role was, okay, how are we going to be ready and prepare for the draft? So a lot of work has gone in. I'm now at the point where I'm super excited for next a week from today. You know, I, I it's been – I've tried to spend early mornings watching amateur, um, watching video on the guys that we're having conversations about because it's quiet early in the morning. And then I, once I get in the office, um, it's, it's, you know, it's not as easy for me to do that. So uh, I feel really good about where we are in our process. But, you know, at the same point, this is about making the Buffalo mm-hmm. Sabres better. So we're going we're gonna to listen and we're going to we're gonna put ourselves in a position where we're open to any scenario. Um, but we are excited about, uh, you know, the player that we'll get at eight. Some draft prospects are going to play in Europe and get started. Some of your prospects, like uh, Roots Lion and Asplund, uh, Matty Picard, they're going to start the season in Europe on loan. Is there an advantage to either a prospect for the draft or a prospect looking ahead to a spot in the National Hockey League to be playing in Europe right now and to get ready for the season? Well, it's it's unique. I mean, you know, as you guys know, this is my first time through it, but I can't think of any very often where you would have a draft that you're actually watching days before the draft a player that you're looking to possibly take play right now, you know? So you're, you're having these – these players actually in game action. Um, I always think guys, it's better for young guys to be playing. Um, I think getting up every day, having your routine, um, competing and, and you guys know, I mean, it's one thing to train and to do informal skates or skill sessions. It's another thing to have true live, you know, practice and game tempo. So I think it's an advantage for sure. And in terms of our young prospects, um, you know, I, 
I think just because of the world we're in right now and the uncertainty and what's going to happen and when is our season going to start and what's the American League going to look like, I think it's really good for our, our young kids to be playing. Uh, One other, oh, go ahead, go ahead, River. Well, I was going to just say, you know, you have some young players in the organization that have taken a little bit of time to marinate uh, in the minors and junior um, players like Tage Thompson and Casey Middlestad, Dylan Cousins. Where do you see their roles uh, with the with the Sabers this year? Yeah, I, you know, I think it's interesting that the the league has changed in a sense where I do think that younger players are more prepared to play in the National Hockey League than they maybe used to be. And I don't know if that's because of the training and even at a young age, players understand fitness. They understand, um, you know, diets and all the things that maybe ribs you, you weren't thinking about. We were the same age. Whoa, I mean, whoa, whoa, whoa. Why, you know, sure why eat? Every night. I know, I know. But, you know. Hey, I'm the guy that thought bench press would, only, would get you to the NHL. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> and so, but I, I think that um, there still needs to be a level of, of earning your spot. And um, I do also think that, that, you, you rarely, rarely would ever go back and say a guy spent too much time in the American Hockey League. He was too ready for the NHL. You know, you you want to put guys in a position to succeed, not put guys in a position to maybe be set up for failure. So um, it's on the prospects to own their own development and get themselves prepared to go earn a job. Um, but you want to make sure you're protecting them as well. So I think it's a balance, Ribs. I think we'll we want to put the best players in our lineup. And if guys are ready, regardless of their age, they'll be on our team. Instigators being joined right now with uh, General Manager Kevin Adams of the Buffalo Sabres, just kind of going over everything leading up to the draft, too. Hey, I, I mean, there's got to be a little bit of, of a proud guy in there when you look at the draft prospects and you see three guys that you had a hand in developing. You have a Luke Tuck, Colby Ambrosio, Trevor Kuntar. Correct me if I'm missing somebody, but – you know, what does that do for you knowing now that you're a general manager? I mean, I'm not saying that automatically means you pick those players, but it's got to be cool to know that you could have a hand in their development even going forward or knowing where they are now coming through your system. Yeah, um, I think that there may be five uh, former junior saver players on the draft list, which is which is pretty, you know, it's great to see. I think part of the vision of when Harbor Center was built years ago and Terry and Kim – um, put this investment in our city was okay. How do we how do we put ourselves in a position where we're developing hockey players? We're putting Buffalo on the map um, to do something special in the hockey world. And so, when this all began years ago, there was there was conversations around this O2 age group. Um, okay, that would give us a real you know. I mean, Marty, you remember back yeah. in in the beginning was okay. These O2s. Let's see where they are in our development path. So the fact that there's, you know, five of these kids, I think, on the list is exciting. Um, you know, I think the benefit we have, um, Andrew, when we look at any anyone that's kind of come through the Junior Sabre kind of local academy hockey system is we have an incredible amount of knowledge um, besides what they are on the ice. You know who they are as a person. You know their work ethic. You know what they do. Um, you know, in the weight room, you know how serious they are about the game. I mean, those are critical advantages um, when you're talking about projecting a player because you guys know how hard it is to make this league, and, and talent's great, but you need all those other things, and I think that's where we could, uh, you know, have some valuable information. So how I, many of the – oh, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I believe our first Pee Wee development camp was the O2 age group, and we're looking back to uh, a few years now. But um, so we used a lot of – tools where we had motivational speaker come in and i i mean there was uh, from the danny gares to many other tools that we use how do you prepare for a possible training camp or not knowing what it is but are you thinking some of the same tools will be uh, an added commodity to uh, to training camp and be able to send the same message to the pros that we use with the peewee kids yeah i mean i think i think the the unknown of the world we're living in right now is is real, but I think you can either use it as an excuse or you can use it as an opportunity. And the opportunity side is how am I going to make sure that I'm better than um, when I come we come out of this and we're ready for training camp than you were previously. And I think that um, that's a mental kind of makeup and mindset that we're we're trying to put in front of our players. Um, because I promise you this. 
players and prospects across the world will get better through this time. And if you're not one of them, then you're kind of at a disadvantage. So that to me is, is just a kind of a mindset that we want all our players to have in terms of what we do and how we, you know, Ralph and I actually are going to get together in the next uh, week here and start talking about what does it look like training camp? He's going to have um, coaching meetings. He's going to have the Rochester coaches and our player development staff involved in all of that as we prepare Nobody knows what that day is, but let's be over-prepared and ready to go, and I think that's the same mindset the players should have. Kevin Adams joining us here. We only have a couple more minutes with him. And, uh, you know, it's, it's still important to mention that you are a Stanley Cup champion. Last night the Cup was presented and hoisted, and uh, there are a lot – there are waves of emotions, I think, going through this whole COVID and the bubble and everything. And I'm just curious to know from your perspective what was – guess you can't say what was harder because you didn't play in the bubble, but how did this appear to be in terms of difficulty compared to winning it the way you guys won it or the way they did it? Yeah, it's a great question. I think I, I watched last night and, you know, you get emotional. I mean, looking, just, just watching the Stanley cup get walked out. And for me, just the, just the flashes that go on in my brain of the snapshots of, of what I was fortunate enough to live. Um, there is, it is unbelievable. And, you know, I get chills thinking about it. Um, and can't wait for that day to happen again here. And, did, uh, did you go pick I, up your little replica <laughs> to bring it next to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, you just give it a little hug, you know. Sleep with it. Yeah. You know, it's amazing that you talk about emotional. Guys that win the cup, they get emotional because they get that they get to relive that feeling in their brains. Where guys like myself, Marty, and uh, Petey were emotional because we didn't have a chance to hoist the cup. So <laughs> I get emotional every year, just like you, Kevin, but for different reasons. Yeah, no, I I get it. I mean, like it's what we all put so much work into, and you know, I I do. I honestly get choked up even thinking about it and, and watching it last night. It brings back all those emotions. And and Andrew, I think when I think about what we went through to win and the sacrifice and you know what it takes is is I mean everybody knows how difficult. That's why it's the greatest trophy in sports. But what those guys just did last night and both teams, by the way, they were there in a bubble. The discipline it took and the commitment when you're parking everything and you're saying. You know, I'm all in. And there's no way that the Tampa Bay Lightning players and Dallas, for that matter, didn't have that mentality. We are here to win. Everything else is getting pushed to the side for these next couple months, and, and we're going to go all in. And it's, I'm, I'm impressed with, with the commitment that it took to do that. Craig, you don't recall that I did hoist the cup once. That's right. And I told you, don't ever touch that cup unless you win it. And you and you picked up and held it anyway. Let's ask a Stanley Cup champion if it was right or wrong. Kevin, we had this, we had the keeper of the cup on the show at the prospects thing a couple years ago. And then he brought the cup, obviously. And we wouldn't have had him on otherwise. And uh, it was sitting right in front of me. And I did not hoist it over my head like a champion. I just put my arms around it. And I just lifted. I just wanted to see how heavy it was. I certainly wasn't like, yeah, yeah, king of the world. I was just kind of like, I just wanted to see how heavy it was. That's all I did, right yeah. or wrong. Yeah, I am definitely with Riz on this one. Do you, uh, yeah, I mean, Andrew, come on. Like, <laughs> There's some <laughs> things you just don't touch. You have to earn it, and I cannot believe you touched it that day. Well. <laughs> He said I could, so I did. I love you, though, Andrew. It's all right. I mean, you know. No, he no. said I could. He, he's, I asked him. I said, can I? He said, go ahead. I didn't. I just picked it up literally six inches off, seven, ten inches off the table. You know, and I will just so just I don't know if you guys know this, but like when you when you have your party and like the keeper, the cuffs there, if someone wants to hold it, the you're supposed to hand it to them. The can't, you're not supposed to just take it and put it over your head. Like you, it has to be handed to you by someone that won it. So yeah, by the champ. Yeah, so it's kind of a cool, like unwritten rule with the cuff. So <laughs> at least you can throw it up over your head, Andrew. And hey, you're a young guy. You never know. You get another shot at this. Never, never. Uh, <laughs> I, I honestly, I slept great that night. I really did. It didn't bother me one bit. I'm like, I just, I don't care because I don't know that I'll ever get this chance again. And I put my kid in the cup and took a picture with it. So I went all out. Anyway. Kevin, great to have you on. Thank you. We know you're busy. 
Enjoy the rest of your day. We'll see you at the draft. We won't see you at the draft, but we'll be seeing you at the draft. I appreciate you having me, guys. Always good catching up. Yeah, same. Thank you very much. Thanks. Kevin Adams joining us here. We'll uh, we'll get into everything. And, and definitely, you know, one thing, uh, you know, just Bob McKenzie's tweet. Kevin touched on it. We'll touch on it. We'll tell you our thoughts on it. Instigators coming up. Lots to talk about. WGR 550.